Okay, fine. Good morning, Alma. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this lockdown basis that we have to try out. Um, I would like to thank Optimus for sponsoring this event and Dr. Rilo Puerta. Thank you that you give us once us. Um, thank you for being with us, Dr. Rilo Puerta. Um, we can't wait to hear some positive news in these times. Um, yeah, and just thank you to everybody who has signed in that supporting us. Um, we really, really need each other in these times. And before I introduce our first speaker today, I would just like to appeal to all our members to buy local, keep it local, spend every rent that you have in your immediate area. Because right now, when you lose a rent in the area, it's not coming back. We don't have the money to bring those um, money back to the area. We need to stimulate and keep on supporting our own local economy. And with those words, I would like to introduce Lauren Smith, the first speaker from Optima. Thank you guys, thank you so much once again, and welcome everybody. Good day to everyone. I think uh, the host just uh, muted me or hopefully everyone can hear me. My name is Lawrence Smith. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Optimum Group. And uh, yeah, what a privilege to speak to you guys from, from here out of a beautiful sunny Cape Town. And we, as we are sitting all over the country at the moment, uh, the last few months has been horrific to all of us. And hopefully we can add you guys some some insight on what's going on. There was crises in the past, and, and this, this is a huge crisis, but as you will hear from Francois and Dr. Rulof, um, crisis also seems to, to pass. So we had just a little bit of a background of Optimum Financial Services Group. Uh, we are constantly strive to provide our clients with the most suitable financial advice and solutions. That for the individual needs in every aspect of comprehensive financial planning. Our focus is to develop and protect your wealth by offering superior advice and transparent guidance for the purpose of estate planning, risk cover, investment planning, retirement provision, and tax planning. Our highly skilled teams also render services in medical aids, legal services, asset finance, and short-term insurance. And we just recently uh, are proud to announce that we will be opening our nail spray office within the next couple of months. And uh, a guy called Rikos for Yun is already in nail spray and is uh, well supported by the by the local community. We are equipped with a skill of, of highly um, admin personal committed to client service, making use of the latest high tech systems. And we at Optimum Group set a standard for distinctive and efficient service. We are also proud to have a Guernsey partner in for our offshore investments and with a fully operational offices in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. Gun is the distinctive knowledge and passion, and with highly skilled and qualified advisors, we are sure we can assist every single client of us. And our passion lays with our clients and their financial well-being. And when you become a client of Optimum, you become part of a family and a lifelong friend. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Francois Boerta. He's just going to give you a little bit of a background of what's happening in the market, and just a show short review of Francois joining me from our Cape Town office. He obtained his MCOM in financial risk management from the University of Stellenbosch. The theme of his thesis is measuring South African equity managers skills using portfolio opportunity distributions. During this period, he conducted research into innovative and new methodologies for identifying and isolating managers and fund performance longevity. In 2010, he joined the Navari investment team and became head of their multi-management team. Francois was an active member of the management research team and assisted with due diligence on various platforms locally and internationally, including multi-manager portfolio management and quants reporting. He's still a part-time lecturer at the Statistics and Actuarial Science Department at Stellenbosch University, and he's currently studying for his CAIA charter, although designation has been in industry since 2010. Francois, without further ado, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Thanks for that uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone is able to hear me and uh, will be able to see me quite quite soon. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm 
just going to put on a, a few slides that I, that I would like to, to share with you guys today. Um, and the focus today is f from my part is specifically going to be on uh, what's going on in the market. Um, obviously, we've seen a lot of turmoil in the last couple of, of months. So I just want to give you some background on where we stand in the markets, what the thinking is um, from a portfolio manager side. Um, and hopefully in your own uh, personal investments, um, there's something that you can take out of this. Um, I think uh, this, the slide that's currently on the on the screen is till end of May. Um, and we've seen that the, the year-to-date figure for our all share index, we're still down 10% um, in, uh, at the end of May. Uh, during June, we've seen another quite a, a big rally. Um, so we've almost backed on a year-to-date basis, almost back where we started at the um, at the end of December, so a deep, deep uh, a drop during March, almost 30 odd percent that we've lost in the market, um, and then quite a strong recovery. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on on the recovery, what's been uh, behind it, what has driven markets in the last couple of months, and also perhaps just the risk that that we still see in in the markets. Um, the global markets, I also show that to you in in dollar terms, um, and the story is more or less the same. Quite a, a deep uh, bear market during March, end of February, uh, start of March, and then we've seen this this uh, quite decent uh, recovery. I think it's better to, to show it to you on, a, on a, um, a line graph. And on the top right, you will see uh, that's just the, the all share index. Um, so as I said, uh, end of Feb, beginning of March, we've seen that quite a big crash in, in a local market. And then that uh, April, May, we've seen uh, a decent recovery, and even into June, we've seen quite a quite a bit of a recovery on our market. So uh, we back at levels where we were at, at November, December last year. Um, now you can you can think for yourself whether you see the, the world as being um, in the same place as December or November your last year. Um, I think the world is not not yet back at at where it was, um, but the equity market certainly recovered quite a bit. Um, bottom left, I'm showing you the NASDAQ. That is one of the uh, United States uh, equity indices. Um, and you'll see that the recovery that they've seen since the, the bottom in, in March, um, they actually currently um, recovered all their losses and they moved past the point where they were at end of end of Feb. So there's a there's a big recovery in the, in the market market. Um, obviously from a portfolio manager side of view, uh, you need to have your equity allocations correct. Uh, you need to participate when markets are running and you need to protect when markets are, are falling. Um, perhaps easier said than done, but there's some uh, risk that we that we currently see in the market and we're almost back to trying to protect at, at this stage. Um, and hopefully that, that message will get clear as I move through the through the presentation. Just taking us back, our local market, um, unfortunately, didn't enjoy the, the best of time since 2014. Um, so basically, since 2014, uh, the, the market went sideways till February this year. So that's a period of, of almost six years that you haven't got any returns on the, on the equity market. And then you receive that 30% uh, bear market in, in the start of, of this year. So not the best place for, for South African investors. And obviously, if you've got a pension fund, yes, that's, that's worrying to see that our market um, didn't do anything in the last six years. But it comes back to, to valuations as well. So let's take a further step back. If you look at the graph where it starts in, in 2010, um, so that's just after the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, the financial, the global financial crisis. Um, you see your, your equity returns almost doubled in, in that, or more than doubled in that period up until uh, 2014. And then since then we, we went sideways. Now, if you look at valuations, and that's, that's just what, I, what I'm putting up on the, on the screen now, um, is what this shows you is how cheap or how expensive is the market. So whenever the, the line um, is below the, the red dotted line, then you can see, okay, the market is cheaper than, than average. Uh, obviously the, the 
the bottom dotted line is one standard deviation below average and the green dotted line above the red line is one standard deviation above um, your average. But whenever the, the solid line is one standard deviation below average, then the market is quite cheap. And you can see here in 2010, 2011, the market was extremely cheap. So when you bought into that period into the market, um, you received this return that I've showed you. From 2010, you see this, this spectacular run in equities. Um, yes, there's, there's more uh, reasons behind that, but one of the major things is when you buy into a market when it's really cheap, um, then your your subsequent returns is normally quite quite good. Um, if you look at where the market is is today, we're seeing again the market is extremely cheap at at this stage. Um, so what does that tell you for future returns? Well, if history repeats itself, um, and we can do the study for for many many years, uh, it actually shows that if you buy the market at cheap levels, then you tend to receive quite decent returns going going forward. Um, so there's definitely opportunities in our market. We we are um, a bit more more positive on on equities. Um, the reason why we've seen this this massive run since March is all the reserve banks of the world came to to the market and basically just flushed the market with with liquidity. So this is um, just all the central banks that's that's pumping liquidity into into the market, and you can see this the spike here at the end of uh, well um, in in March when the COVID crisis really hit the markets. You see the the reserve banks across the world um, came to the table and just flushed the market with a lot of liquidity. Um, so what that does is it's cheap money being put into the system. Um, hopefully it will flow through to businesses, but it also flows into your, your equity market. So your support for the market is coming from the central banks. The risk to that is, uh, I think it's uh, quite quite nicely shown on, on this graph, is your recovery in your equity market at this stage is, is purely based on the liquidity that's being provided by central banks. Think of it in the South African context. Um, we know a couple of weeks ago, our president also announced a, a 500 billion rand, um, call it liquidity, that, that he will provide to, um, to smaller businesses and the economy. Now, the same applied to the rest of the world where the central bank stepped in and said, okay, but we'll support the market. Um, and what is shown here is just a recovery on the S&P again the the US uh, market index and you see the the recovery is purely based on how much support it is getting from the central bank um, the question today is whether this is sustainable whether the central bank can keep on supporting the markets and what will happen if they take their, their foot off the pedal if they start to say okay but this is it we can't support the market anymore then your private sector and all the other sectors in the economy must actually step in and, and support markets. It makes it difficult from a portfolio management uh, side because you can't really fight the Fed. That's a, that's a saying that's uh, quite well known. Don't fight the Fed because obviously the Fed, the um, American Reserve Bank, their checkbook is, is quite sizable. Um, but you can't fight the Fed, but there's also a risk. What if they stop to, to provide this liquidity for, for the market? So currently in, in the opt human portfolios. Um, we did, I think, fairly well to protect the, the fall in, in the March. Um, we definitely participated in the, in the run or the recovery that we saw. Um, currently, we are slightly concerned that the, the liquidity that's being provided in the markets is driving the market and it creates another a risk that if the liquidity dries up, um, markets can potentially go into negative territory again. Um, I think it's also important to look at, at history when you look at uh, uh, asset prices. Um, so what I've done here or the research that, that I've uh, done here or received is from all the other financial crises, what happened to our, our equity market? Um, so you can go back on the 2002-2003 RAND collapse, the global 
global financial crisis and crisis. In all these crises, our equity market dropped um, by more than 20%. That's a definition for, for a bear market. Um, so your equity market dropped more than 20%. And you see, it actually takes quite a long period for, for the market to start um, to recover again. What we've seen now in the red line is we've seen this massive fall, um, quite a quick fall as well, the quickest one from all this, these crises, a quick drop. And then we've seen this, this decent recovery again. Um, the question obviously is whether this recovery is sustainable, whether we can uh, go forward from, from these levels and, and keep um, the equity market at, at these levels. Um, History tells tells us that it's that's fairly difficult for a market to to recover from a bear market that quickly. Um, so I think there's still risk in the in the system. I think you must be very uh, prudent in your asset allocation. I think you must be very um, on the ball on which equities you own, how much equities you own, and when to buy and when to sell. Another thing that um, it's actually Alan Gray's research that that also speaks to this fact of uh, you need expertise in, in buying equities today. And this is just to show you our, our total market um, in, in the red is if you include NASPERS, Richmond, um, Anglos and, and Bulletin, how the equity market obviously, uh, how the returns are looking. But it's driven by these four shares. And these four shares are the, are the big market cap shares in, in our all share index. Um, and they've pulled up the, the market. Um, if you exclude them, then you would end up with this uh, grayish line. And that's the other 163 shares. And you'll see basically, again, since 2014, none of this um, has managed to, to perform fairly well. Yes, there's obviously one or two that, that's doing well, but because of their size, um, they're not pulling the market. It's these four shares that, that is pulling the market. So that makes stock picking quite, quite important in today's market. Um, so I think on, on equities, hopefully I've given you some, some background on the risk that there is. There's a lot of liquidity, uh, whether that's sustainable, is, is the question we're battling with at, at this stage. And then on the stock pickers side, um, I think you definitely need some, some expertise in your portfolio. Just on the, on the bond side, um, obviously in the optimum funds, we, we do allocate to different asset classes. We've got asset classes in um, uh, the local equity market. We've got uh, assets in bonds, in um, offshore markets. So we do need to cover both, both sides of, of uh, quite a few sides of, of um, what's going on in, in asset markets. Um, so on the, on the bond side, the uh, Reserve Bank cut interest rates quite a bit. Um, so the, the nice thing at the start of the year is if, if we found the, the banks like a Standard Bank and an APSA and you tell them, listen, I've got, let's call it 10 million rand, um, give me a, a rate for that, then you see on the gray line, they will would have offered you uh, call it seven and a half percent. So it was fairly easy to get seven and a half percent and you invest the money with the bank for four years time. Um, if you say, okay, I only want to invest for three months, then you get call it six and 6.75%. Um, now with the interest rates being cut so much, if we find the bank now and we tell them, listen, we need to invest your, your money for, for 12 months, the bank is going to offer you less than 5%. Um, and that's the downside of interest rates being being so low. Um, so your short term, call it safe haven, in uh, income type of, of investment struggled, uh, will struggle going forward because of the, the low interest rates. Um, so on what we've done in the portfolios on the on the bond side is to just extend our duration. And I'm showing you here two graphs. That's the yield curve. So that's if you go longer out duration. Now you don't phone the bank and say, listen, I want to invest the money for, for 12 months. Um, you say, okay, perhaps I must invest my money for six, seven years. Um, then you buy the R186, which is one of our government bonds. Um, and you can see here what happened to the curve since end of November 2019, the curve was quite flat. So going out on duration from R208 on the orange line to R186, 
there wasn't co there wasn't a big pickup in your yield that you receive, but you're taking a lot more duration risk. Um, at the end of March, you got quite a decent pickup from taking slightly longer duration. So in our portfolios, we took advantage of that. This we bought quite a quite a few longer duration bonds. Um, yes, there were risk in in our bond markets. Obviously, the downgrade is is one of them. Um, but that's again where where yields is is coming. And we've seen that our bond yields are very much higher than than all our competitors. Um, and this is what I'm showing you on on this graph. Uh, if if we got downgraded downgraded like we did end of end of March, um, we're still competing with the likes of Brazil, Vietnam, um, Greece, and we're still much more attractive on on the yield that we can get from from these um, from these bonds. So in our opinion, the, the downgrade was a non-event. It was already priced into our bonds. We allocated quite a decent amount to, to bonds and the payoff was was obviously quite quite good for us. Um, just to explain to you differently how we thought our, our, our fourth process um, around the downgrade is if you look at our bond yield compared to all emerging markets, um, you see that we got Recently, spread of one percent over emerging markets. So, if you invest in our bonds versus emerging markets, you received one percent more. Um, but yeah, since 20, well, since Nenegate, that spread widened a bit. And then prior to the downgrade, you just see this this constant increase in the amount of pickup that you get um, from buying our bonds versus, let's say, a Brazilian bond. Um, so you could have received six percent more being invested in a South African bond than being invested in um, a Brazil government bond. And I think for, for South Africans, um, we perhaps always think that our country is, is the worst and um, yeah, there's no future in, in our market or in, in our country. But the guy that's sitting in, in New York managing money, he just think about emerging markets as a basket. So he's just going to think, okay, Brazil, South Africa, uh, it's all emerging markets. Give me the bond that pays me the most. Um, and at that stage, our bonds were were very uh, were screaming that it's that it's decent valuations. Um, so we picked up quite a bit of of these bonds. It paid off quite well for us. Um, and we still think there's there's decent value in in our bonds. Um, last couple of slides, just touching on the the rent. The rent obviously also. Uh, blew out when when this crisis hit. That's just because all um, currencies basically flown back to the UN, US dollar. Um, in in all the the crises that we've seen before, um, you sell your risky assets like emerging markets and you buy your your US treasury or US bonds, which is seen as the risk free asset. Um, and that caused the, the rent to blow out quite a bit. Yes, there were some South African factors as well. There will always be South African factors in the, the currency. Um, but the rent reached levels that uh, we thought, um, and together with, with Doc Ruloff's insight, uh, it reached levels that, that we just thought, okay, this is, this is slightly overdone. Or not slightly, it's very much overdone. Um, I think the nice thing that you can do in, in a portfolio is to hedge your offshore exposure, and we've put in some some edges on our offshore exposure. Um, so at this stage, whenever the rand is below 18 rand 20 to the dollar, we're actually making money on on our offshore exposure. So if the rand comes back to four, well 14 or 15 rand or even 16 rand, we're still making quite a decent amount of money on on our um, offshore exposure. So yeah, that's that's quickly running through a couple of, of asset classes and just just how we look at the world, how we manage portfolios within within Optimum. Obviously, um, it's always good to have a look at at portfolios as well um, and performance. And I think uh, our funds did fairly well over over all the one year, two year, and three year period. Our stable fund is a low equity um, fund that we that we run, and I compare it here to some of the Call it bigger, well-known guys out there, and I think we've done done fairly well. Um, also on the on the balance fund side, uh, we consistently performing um, 
performing quite well against these these bigger names. Um, this is, as I said, the, the balance funds. It's a medium equity fund, and then lastly, just our managed growth fund, which is a it's it's our high equity fund, a fund with the most equity. Um, allocation just on a on a peer group level um, what i've done here is i've taken the funds into the uh, specific categories and um, whenever there's a light green um, block next to the, next to the number you can you know that it's in the top 25 percent of all funds in in south africa the darker green um, with the two in it uh, means that it's in the top half of of all funds in South Africa. So consistently outperforming the average um, and over longer term in the top 25% of, of all funds. Um, I'm going to leave it there on, on the fund uh, management side. Hopefully you, you got something out of it on, on how we think about managing money um, in, in this crisis period. Um, obviously a lot of the, the thoughts that goes into our, our process is from Doc Rulof Bueta, our next speaker. Um, so Doc Rulof is, is currently um, our economic advisor at the Optimum Investment Group. He has been that since 2017. He's also the joint manager director of GOPA uh, Group SA, a multidisciplinary research company that specializes in development uh, facilitation. He's been an uh, economic advisor to PwC for the past 17 years and is um, an experienced presenter um, and consultant. In 2005, he received the Sarko Firentunach APSA uh, Award for Economist of the Year based on his accuracy of uh, forecast of key economic indicators. Um, and as I said, he also helped us to, to help uh, to put on those edges with, with the currency. Um, his forecast there worked out quite well and also on the bond yields. So there's quite a long list of, of things that we rely um, on him for. Um, he's the author of more than 100 articles, books and research um, publications, obviously in most of the daily newspapers uh, on a regular basis. Uh, Dr. Rolof uh, experience includes management accounting of listed industrial companies. He's the financial, uh, financial editor of a daily newspaper, um, uh, economy policy advisor in the Department of Finance, senior economics lecturer at uh, University of Pretoria and UJ, and chief economist of South African Federated Chambers of Industries, and visiting lecturer at Gordon Institute Business Science, or GIPS, and the Tswane University of Technology. Um, I think everyone is uh, quite familiar with him. Um, so with that, I'm introducing Doc Rulof. Uh, thank you, Doc. We're looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much. Um, apparently I'm on screen now. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I just want to mention to you that I also have four children and seven grandchildren. So I haven't just studied. And um, two of my previous jobs were a financial editor of a daily newspaper, as Francois mentioned, and also uh, a management accountant at the bakery group. And I learned two important lessons in those jobs. People do not like stale news and they don't like stale bread either. And I'm not going to give you stale data, uh, up-to-date data, just as Francois has done. Uh, maybe one comment before I forget, which I just dotted down, um, uh, what, what Francois said, is that the downgrade by Moody's was in fact a non-event. Um, the effect of that had already been priced in, and what happened to the rand afterwards was purely related to COVID-19. So one must not see too much in that, quite frankly. And I also <clears throat> uh, hope that the viewers now understand why I shifted my pension <laughs> when I left UJ uh, several years ago to Optimum, because um, it, it's more secure and it's growing at a much faster rate. And, and thank you very much for that, Francois. Francois uh, and I uh, shared this uh, many uh, patients, uh, same surname, but we're not related. I wouldn't mind, by the way. Uh, but he's much more modest than I am. Uh, and you would have noticed from these latter slides that uh, optimum performance is in fact um, uh, in, its, in its peer group for the size of asset, assets that they manage is, as far as I'm concerned, second to none. Uh, getting on to 
my own slides. Um, here we go. I just want to open it on the slide so I trust everybody can see that. And I'm not going to be too long-winded because we have been bombarded with uh, data and information on the COVID and on the economy, etc. And in a recent uh, Bill Stompton column, I made the point that let's stop talking about whether uh, our economy is going to uh, shrink by five or six or seven percent. Let's rather start focusing on which sectors are likely to be the leading sectors in the recovery and what can we do and what can government uh, do to remove obstacles to growth once as, as we start moving out of this. And I think the timing of this webinar is, is really excellent. It wasn't rehearsed, but last night's announcement is, is really very good news. It's good news for uh, literally hundreds of thousands of South Africans uh, between half a million and a million that are involved in the hospitality industry, uh, in, in, in conferencing, etc., all our hairdressers. Uh, within the next couple of days, hopefully, we will find out all the details about um, how they are going to open up, but it has been announced, so that's really good news. And I don't want to repeat what Francois said, but just to also point out uh, how severe this uh, effect was. Uh, this is a unique event. It can, it can literally not be compared to anything else. The Great Depression, if you include the effect of the Second World War, as most historians do, lasted in fact for 16 years. You cannot compare uh, a recession that's going to last for a couple of quarters with an event like that. It, it, it is just ridiculous. Uh, tens of millions of people lost their lives in bloodshed, uh, in, in uh, uh, the, the level of violence and, and poverty that accompanied the Great Depression and the Second World War is, is uh, hopefully will never ever be repeated in the world again. This is not Mickey Mouse, it is a serious uh, situation. And quite frankly, I believe that we should learn to live with this just as we have learned to live with flu uh, and, and be a little bit more uh, aware of hygiene protocols. So there you see the, the bond yield. This was a relatively easy one to call because as Francois said, our bond yield uh, in, the, in the middle of March was crying out, please buy me, please buy me. And I can guarantee you a lot of fund managers everywhere in the world made a lot of money on South African bonds uh, and obviously Optimum as well um, within uh, a degree of conservatism, which is good because you don't want your pension to be in the hands of, of gamblers, quite frankly. Uh, you can also see the same thing with the rent. Interesting point, you can clearly see that the South African rent is susceptible to political events with the minister, it depreciated dramatic, dramatic when Ramaphosa was, was elected. After that, there were the trade wars, uh, there was lethargy in implementing the reforms that had been promised. And what many people tend to forget is that Mr. Ramaphosa inherited two factions of the ANC. And if there's anybody out there that doesn't believe, the ANC consists of two factions, you know, being welcome to reality. Um, he won by a very small margin, and there are people even today inside the cabin that are still clinging uh, to ideological preferences over economic experience. And he has to change that mindset. Fortunately, he's not alone. He's got Dieter Mbouwemi on his side. He's got quite a number of cabinet ministers, I like to believe, that are trying their best to move this economy into a more pragmatic policy environment. Uh, and we've seen another uh, trickle of that, um, some good news in the last couple of days with the National Planning Commission. They have just announced that they are going to uh, try to engineer the formation of a holding company based on private sector company principles for all state-owned enterprises. And the purpose of this is to prevent political meddling. And uh, I was absolutely delighted to hear about the uh, prosecution, pending prosecution of people involved with the v BBS bank. Uh, I mean, that was just blatant theft. There's no, there's no other word for it. Uh, and, and the message is going to become stronger and stronger. Uh, the, thanks to the internet era, the ever, all the evidence is there. It's in the cloud. 
so uh, this is very bad news for some politicians as well. The rand recovered quite nicely, but the rand, rand will remain volatile. And that's why it's so important, and Francois alluded to this, it's very important to have expert advice in these days because volatility will remain a feature. The real effective exchange rate of the rand, which is an interesting slide headline, I don't want to be too technical, is <clears throat> where the rand wants to be and where it's supposed to be, where it's not over or undervalued. And that level is in the vicinity of 14 rand 70 to the dollar. Uh, it was well on its way. I just want to make a point, sorry. Uh, the blue line here is not the value of a dollar. What you see in the paper, 16, 17, 18, that's the price that you pay for a dollar. This blue line is the price of a rand in terms of a basket of currency. So if the blue line declines, the rand and vice versa. So the rand was well on its way after Ramaphosa's victory back to overvalued territory. When the trade war hit us and then the coronavirus hit. Um, and that's why I'm bullish over the short, medium and long term prospects for the South African currency. But there will be volatility without a shadow of doubt. Other problems that we have, of course, is uh, our, our debt GDP ratio will increase. And it's so irritating when uh, cynical economists keep on hopping about this. So what? Uh, okay, so we're in a recession. Every country in the world, every country in the world is currently facing the same problem. And with very low interest rates, means that you have a margin. In other words, your debt servicing costs are going to decline. So you can actually afford to up your a little bit. So this is not you know, the end of the world. Uh, and by the way, we are still very comfortable compared to our peers. Um, uh, now that um, sports events will probably be, be next to, to open up again, uh, we may be able to go and watch uh, some uh, rugby again very shortly. I believe uh, initially uh, only behind closed doors and others, no spectators, which should not be a big problem for the Bulls because <laughs> they're actually used to that. Um, and by the way, I live uh, not too far from Los Fersa, but I could take it on the chip. Uh, this is a fascinating slide. Um, with some colleagues of mine, we tried to determine what the uh, level five, four, and three of lockdown cost the economy in terms of lost GDP. So the blue bars that you see, 2018, 19, and 2020, uh, first scenario, zero real growth, second scenario, uh, 2%. Growth is what we as a country every week, every week, roughly 100 billion a Level the red bar that you see is what we produced under level five, uh, and and that's frightening. But that once again, that also uh, you can do the same, draw the same graph for most countries in the world will have vaguely similar declines. It was sudden, it was abrupt, it, it was frightening, quite frankly. Then we moved to level four. And there was a significant uh, recovery. We are now uh, in, in level three and we're on our way to level two. And I think that's what we need to focus on is that the red, brown and green bars are moving north. And within the next couple of months, they will be back where they were. And I think that's very important for us to appreciate. In the, in, in the meantime, yes, it's irritating, it's frustrating. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some of us know people that have lost their jobs. Uh, if, if your neighbor loses his job, it's a recession. If you lose your job, it's a depression. Um, but hopefully this will not last too long. And I must make this point. Uh, I must commend South African businesses, even though myself and even some of uh, Optimum's other investors will feel the brunt of lower dividends this year. Uh, what the lower dividends have, have resulted in is that that many companies now uh, are in a position combined with giving their staff a haircut, anything between 10 and 50% for two or three or four months, means that they can retain their staff. And that is much more important to earn. It's more important to learn to earn a little bit less or to not skip a dividend for, for a, an interim period than, you know, than to lose your jobs. So well done there. GDP forecast for selected countries in Europe and the Americas. It's absolutely disastrous. But once again, this is just for 2020. Um, when you shift to Asia, Africa, Middle East, it looks a little bit better. 
uh, and South Africa is in this group, but uh, do not expect it to do very well this year. That's, um, that's a given. Um, some clues over which sectors will be most and least affected and will be uh, the quickest to recover. Uh, in Asia, they've done some significant research on the most resilient sectors, as they call them, and the least resilient sectors. And I like to believe that there are many parallels between this slide and, um, and South Africa as well. I'm not going to labor the point too much. The, the viewers will receive uh, via Zelda um, a, an edited PDF version um, of, um, of the slides in due course. And now let's move to the good news. The good news is that if you look at uh, the period, the last from 4 May to the beginning of June, the way the South African ran and all other, virtually all our peers in emerging market economies just bounced back tremendously. Uh, once again, what this tells you is that it's very dangerous to um, go it alone when it, when it comes to uh, trading in the forex market, trading in bonds, trading in equities. You need some expert advice because you can burn your fingers if your timing is wrong. Timing is everything. Uh, exports and imports, this is very good news. South Africa's uh, trade balance for the first four months of this year is, is virtually zero. That's when your imports equal your exports. And, and this is not such a big deal. Our, uh, our exports have, in fact, done fairly well. We had a stunning first quarter, also for mineral sales. Um, the oil price, I'm, I don't believe that I'm telling you that I'm very glad that the oil price is moving up. Uh, and the reason for that is it's a clear sign that the world economy is starting to get into gear again. Uh, and obviously it's also good for some uh, of our groups of shares. So uh, as long as the oil price stays around there between 40 and 45, I think we should be quite happy. Um, another clue to um, which sectors um, were really hard hit by this, this pandemic can be found in the Visa UK Consumer Spending Index. And if you compare uh, February to April, it, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, clearly, food, bed, food, food and beverages have been doing very well. South Africa beverages not so much because we were not allowed to buy anything except tea and coffee and stuff like that. But that's changed, fortunately, for uh, some of our listed companies as well. And I think what the viewers must try to remember is that it's just a matter of a couple of months before those dark brown, the dark burgundy, I'm not sure about the color, when just a couple of months back to those trends, uh, which have been dwarfed by the, the decline of 80% in consumer spending on hotels and restaurants. I mean, how can you spend money in a restaurant if the, if the place is closed? <laughs> it's impossible. They're all opening up again. They're all opening up again. So um, it's looking good as far as future is concerned. This is one of my prize uh, slides. Being an optimist, I love this type of news. And it is really fascinating. And it shows uh, that very clearly that we are headed for a V-shaped recovery. You've got some other theories uh, surrounding a W and a U and an L. An L is for the, you know, for the extreme pessimists. And I've been said that a, a pure optimist believes we live in the best of all possible worlds, and a pure pessimist fears this is true. I've got bad news for them, for the for the cynics. Just look what happened to the PMIs in the space of one month, one month, from record lows right. Uh, with a sharp increase, and in China's case, already above 50, which is the neutral level. Above 50 means your economy is growing. Below 50 means your economy is not growing. Some sectors may be, of course. And I would, I'd like to predict that within the next two to three months, virtually all of those countries will have purchasing managers indices, composite ones, that's manufacturing and services, which will be above 50. I hope I'm correct. Um, just to demonstrate what happened, Months. They had an low in a composite PMI, went right back up to 50, and it's moving up from there. And they are buying our coal, they're buying our iron ore. Unfortunately, we're buying everything from them. We need to look at that. We need to really um, think about import replacement in these days to boost our manufacturing sector. Back to global GDP growth. This is fascinating. Not since the IMF was formed, not in their entire history, has there been such a large spread between their forecasts for growth for one year 
to the next. And the really good news is, of the earth base, obviously, is that next year we'll be cooking with gas again, virtually every single economy in the world, with the exception probably of Cuba, um, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. Uh, but that's because of their political systems and because of uh, land expropriation without comprehension, uh, I mean, compensation. So we still need to get over that little uh, hurdle. Okay, just a quick South African perspective. Francois touched on in his first slide, if I remember correctly, uh, there, there was the, the pathetic performance of listed equities in South Africa. But if you just look what happened uh, in the space of a couple of weeks to some of the better known um, residential real estate investment trusts, bouncing back by up to uh, more than 40%. Um, the concern is that tenants will not be able to pay their rent, etc., etc. That may be true, but once again, in, within this broad sector, there have been arrangements have been made for temporary uh, stays of payments, um, uh, lower rentals for a three or a four or a five month period, and they will get over this. And even if one or two of those businesses um, happen to close, uh, major listed uh, retail uh, um, closing retail is in serious problems, trouble, but it's not because of COVID. COVID just sort of accentuated that. They were in trouble before then for a variety of reasons, including bad financial management, and I think um, poor training of their staff, uh, who, who uh, didn't treat their customers uh, in the best possible way, as far as I'm concerned, with my own survey and my own um, uh, thoughts on that matter. But just to show you once again, the volatility in the market, uh, and remember in economics, you turn Newton's law on its head, what goes down must go up again. And we're seeing that, that as I speak. The JSE, as Francois indicated, that downswing didn't last very really long. Our bonds are still, that's the very latest bond yield I have for South Africa this morning, uh, according to investment.com, comes in at 9.44. Uh, I think it can still go down substantially, personally. Uh, but once again, there may be a little bit of volatility. Than ever. So there is still a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the market. I don't think uncertainty has ever been at this level. And then the prime overdraft rate, which is at its lowest level in history. Uh, and who would have thought that, given the fact that our Monetary Policy Committee are by their own admission hawkish. Uh, we have come through a period of incredibly high interest rates. Uh, when John Marcus retired in 20, at the end of 20. 14, the new immediately adopted the hawkish approach and they increased the real prime rate from an average of 3%, prime minus CPI, to 6%. That is a 100% increase in the cost of capital, which I still find absolutely frightening. Um, and hopefully the lower interest rates will last for quite a while. Francois indicated that if you have a lot of money in a fixed income account and some of that is in a money this is bad news. I mean, obviously it's bad news. But one should remember what is good for the economy. What is good for an economy like South Africa that needs infrastructure, that needs new productive capital. When interest rates are too high, it is just too easy to make money without really, you know, going to a hell of a lot of effort. And it's like a tax on venture capital. And what right now, with the lower interest rates, if they last for long enough, you will see venture capital coming through. And that is very good news for our economy. Just to make the point about the positive correlation that exists between GDP growth and durables, and in this case I've chosen an example of new vehicles, there is a slight lag involved, but it is a predictable positive relation, relationship. Now let's go one step further, uh, new vehicles, the red line again, and the prime overdraft rate, the cost, which tells you how expensive it's going to be, what your financing costs. Are going to be to buy them. They are basically correlated. And I've been saying this over and over again. We must not underestimate the power of lower interest rates in coming months. My one son has a, a, a million rand bond in his house, and he now has two and a half thousand rand a month more in his pocket. And with the hunting season starting, I can guarantee you he's not going to save that money. He's going to spend it. And I'll have some both on. Uh, my way soon, hopefully. Um, as far as the pre market is concerned, I thought I'd just 
uh, touch on this quickly. Um, it's a fascinating slide because as a rule, uh, there is also an, an inverse correlation between the prime rate and your your growth or the total value of mortgage loans. I've expressed mortgage loan value here in real terms. I've adjusted them for inflation. So uh, that happened between 2005 and 2009 uh, when the uh, financial crisis recession hit us. Quite predictable. I think we remember that, that growth side. The economy grew at 5%. Uh, and then uh, interest rates started increasing. Your mortgage the total value of mortgage loans in real terms started declining. The prime rate came down in the Jill Marcus era, uh, but the mortgage loans kept on declining. And that was mainly as a result of this hangover. There was such a boom that you had so many yuppies, it's actually yumpy, young, upwardly mobile professional, uh, which is a positive, obviously. I mean, the more they are of these people in the society, the better for the economy, obviously. But many of them had bought, bought two or three and even four properties uh, to, to rent out, and they burnt their fingers when uh, during the recession. So that took a hell of a long time, and then John Marcus retired, and the prime rate started increasing uh, in real terms to, to 6%. So the value of mortgage loans kept on declining, and the property, the real property market just stayed where it is, and in some cases it's declined. But that has changed now. It, it started picking up even before the interest rate declines, and I expect the next property boom to be around the corner. I hope I'm correct on that one. Um, I've been fairly busy, uh, myself and Prof. Ilza Boerta, no relation, uh, from UJ. Uh, she was my best student 29 years ago. Uh, she was from Reisburg then, but so she's an Afrikaans, she's a great girl. I think Frans was in our team, with Lawrence uh, Boerta, was for Gullisberg. That's the name of 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 uh, and, and Ilza ran her econometric model. Um, I asked her to, uh, to ask the model to tell us what is likely to happen to mortgage advances uh, in the, the new real prime rates environment with the interest rate reductions, as opposed to if it had stayed at 6% real prime rate. That's the red line. Now, this uh, econometric model does not account for COVID-19. So it's ridiculous to think that the blue line will in fact materialize, but the reality will be somewhere between the two. There's no doubt about that. And there will be, there will be uh, an exponential type increase. And by the way, this was before the latest 50 bips decline. So the, the lower interest, I firmly believe, are going to help us, not only to secure the V-shaped recovery, but, but to actually get into a, a pretty nice growth mode next year. And here you can see the forecasts. Um, Optimums is there as well. Um, the forecast for 2020, they look dismal. Uh, that's predictable. But for next year, uh, out of the 38 economists that participate in this economy of the year competition with Media 24, only two do not expect positive real growth next year. 36 of them, and that median forecast is very close to 3% real growth. When last did we have that? Uh, during the Zuma era that became uh, an endangered species. Uh, and then lastly, uh, also on the economic side, what we did is the, we asked the model, and this was announced uh, a couple of days before the lockdown started. Uh, we asked the model to tell us what would South Africa's GDP have been today if after John Marcus's retirement, the real prime rate had stayed at 3% on average, as it was, as opposed to the 5.3% average real prime, which ensued after the departure with this new hawkish monetary policy committee. And the model told us that our economy would have been 560 billion rand. That is half, more than half a trillion rand. Larger today than it is. And the 560, by the way, is more than the total relief package which has been announced by uh, Mr. Ramaphosa. The, the key to, to uh, thinking about the future, I believe, is to appreciate the impact of GDP. Um, if we can implement, or I like to believe when we start implementing the right policies, um, I'm going to jump to that right now and just mention some of them to you. This is my last slide. If, when we start making these policies, most of which are already 
embodied in the National Development Plan, which was put on the shelf uh, by Mr. Zuma. He either did not read it or he had difficulty in understanding uh, what was the implications of this document. That has now been dusted off and it's receiving a new life. When we start implementing these type of policies, GD in South Africa, even if it's from a low base, can really start taking off next year 3%. 4% is not out of the question and gaining momentum. Um, and that will solve a hell of a lot of problems because whatever is your fiscal deficit, the ratio is important. You divide that by the GDP. And if the denominator increases, uh, you are less, more or less home and dry. Um, we can expect towards later in this year uh, a, a fairly significant shift in the way economic policy is conducted in South Africa. I like to the the trade unions will have less say in economic policy. Uh, and if they can convince uh, the public sector that it is prudent to take a haircut or at least to waive uh, increases in the next year or two, then we can uh, actually approach 2021 20, with a, a, a critical mass of fiscal stability as well. Uh, I like that things that and they will get a hell of a lot better within the next couple of months. Thank you. Uh, from my side, um, I think Zelda or Linda asked me just to, to say thank you to all of you. Thanks for attending. I don't know if there's any um, questions and answers. We can't see any. You're more than welcome to email us at info at Optimum Group or events at Optimum Group if any um, questions to Dr. Rulo, Francois or myself. And thank you again for attending, for the time that you spent to listen to us. It's really a privilege for us to, to try and add value to your lives. And hopefully the rest of 2020 will be a blessed year for all of us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.